This is Amerisim 241 and there is actually quite a substantial amount of it here. Let me quickly provide some nuclear data to help us understand the reason for these measurements. And then we can talk a bit more about americium. So, americium 241 has a half-life of 432 years. It decays to Neptunium 237 via alpha decay with an energy of 5485 kiloelectron volts. Americium 241 is often used as gamma calibration standard because it has a low energy 59.5 kiloelectron volt line. Additionally, it has another line at 26 kiloelectron volts, which are among the most common ones. Due to the short range of alphas and the ease of shielding these gammas, even extremely high activities like this 1.11 gigabecquerels here can be easily and safely stored. 33 counts per second is a nothing. And this is not the americium what we see. The americium is on the back. What we are seeing here is a thin layer of stainless steel. 6500 counts per second is quite a bit more. This comes mostly from scattered gammas. And if I remove the piece and turn it towards the camera, with the americium side facing to it, we can measure a absurdly high activity of more than 500,000 counts per second. The contact dose rate even overwhelms the Como 170, which has a maximum limit of 20 millisieverts an hour. I couldn't handle any other source with that high of a contact dose rate so casually. Since all forms of radiation of americium are easily shielded, it is possible in this case. But by the way, I'm not standing directly behind the phone and staring into the source for shots like these, but it's quite remarkable how easy high activities of americium can be shielded to near background levels. Now onto the analysis. To avoid 100% dead time and a potential detector contamination, the ring source is placed on a detector with the iron facing down and the active side facing up. The lid was closed to prevent someone, in the unlikely case, from opening the detector and staring directly onto the source. This is where the fun begins. With 50% dead time, a spectrum was recorded with a lifetime of 1750 seconds. The 59.5 kilo electron volt americium 241 line is quite obvious with a occurrence probability of 35.9% and americium 241 has many other gamma lines with very low occurrence probabilities. Here's a list of all those with a range of up to 10 to the power of minus 4%. However, these peaks are broader due to the high dead time, so I took another spectrum where I placed the sealed source directly on the detector. Even probabilities of 10 to the power of minus 5% are visible. And here we come across something interesting. These peaks over here. A look at the NDS shows that the 228, 277 and 312 do not belong to the decay of americium 241 to neptunium 237. They can't be some peaks either because we would also see one at around 120 kiloelectron volts. But taking a step back and considering how americium 241 is produced, now it gets interesting. Americium 241 must be artificially produced by irradiating uranium 238 with neutrons. Through plutonium 239, plutonium 241, you can then get americium 241 via beta minus decay of plutonium 241. This can further be irradiated. And by further irradiated, I don't mean that you have a pure americium 241 and then irradiate this separately, but you have all isotopes between uranium 238 and americium 241 as a mixture in the reactor, which simply form over time. After such a few elements life cycle, there can be everything up to Einsteinium 256 inside. But you can separate the elements afterwards, or if you really want those spicy elements, you can separate curium and then irradiate a curium oxide aluminium target separately. Off topic, what I wanted to get to, when americium was discovered, it was produced by irradiating plutonium. And significant amounts of curium was also formed from americium 242. The separation of americium and curium was apparently so tedious, because they are chemically too similar, that americium was also called pandemonium. And here we come to the actual problem. The 277 is undoubtedly a peak. Emissions from americium 241 are impossible, they are too far away, and even if the occurrence probabilities were far too low for this height. So, let's look further. Could it be Neptunium 237 lines? No, it doesn't match the energy, etc. Well, what else could there be? Are there americium isotopes, like americium 242, for example? Yes. 
But which one? Probably the Amerism 242M. The cross section of 640 barn is simply much better and even if the Amerism 242G has formed, we wouldn't measure it today due to its half-life. 141 years, yeah that could still be in there, but it only has one line at 42 kilo electron volts. And we don't see that as it can't be measured by the Geely. So for now, we don't know. Could be there, but we don't know. Well, let's come back to that later. What's next? Well, Amerism 242M, which was produced in large quantities, is in radioactive equilibrium with the 242G. And that's interesting. Now, if we look at the neutron capture cross section, both can easily form Amerism 243. And that could also be present. We are generally only talking about traces in this case. And we definitely see something at 74 kilo electron volts, 86 kilo electron volts, which 0.346% and at 117 kilo electron volts with an occurrence probability of 0.56%. So that fits. Very nice, low traces, but it's in there. Okay, let's take a step back. In this sample, americium 242 is in equilibrium with its own isomer and the americium 242G will constantly produce curium-242. 83% for the beta minus decay, only 17% for the electron capture to plutonium-242. And there we are again with such a long-lived radionuclei that we couldn't measure it. So, do we see curium-242? Again, it's very shy when it comes to gammas. Only the 44.8 kilo electron volt line, but that won't be visible. The next hope would be the 101. Point 93 kilo electron volt line with 0.00253%, but this could also be easily hidden in that peak. Because this peak is due to Amerism 241, which has a line with an occurrence probability of 0.0195%, and we are able to detect Amerism 241 lines down to 10 to the power of minus 5% easily. So Curum 242 could be in there, but if it is, we don't see it that well. Okay, status update. Amerism 241, everything up to 10 to the power of minus 5% is easily visible, but the 277 line doesn't come from Amerism 241, as it doesn't emit such a line. We've looked into what it could be. It can't be the daughter nucleus because Neptunium 237 doesn't have this line. And also chemically identical Amerism 242 is not visible in the spectrum. The 242M will definitely be in there, but due to the single 42 kilo electron volt line, it can't be visible. It's in radioactive equilibrium with the Amerism 242G, which also can't be detected. And its decay products cannot be identified due to either their long half-life or the absence of gamma lines. Curium-242 could possibly be in there, but its single line is overshadowed by Amerism-241 lines. And further production of Amerism-243 in the reactor has been proven. None of these are explanation to fit the 277 kilo electron volt line. But at the moment, we are keeping other possibilities open. Assuming that curium-242 is present, curium-243 could also be present in the reactor. And this has a line at 277 kilo electron volts with an occurrence probability of 14%. This is even the highest. The second highest with 10% would be the 228 line. This fits perfectly. The third line would be the 209 kilo electron volt line, but this is way deep in the 208 kilo electron volt peak from Americium 241. So now we have our answer. This is Curium 243. Wait a moment. Curium 242 will constantly be generated, but it's not measurable. Curium 243 will not be regenerated in the Americium 241 sample. So we have a fixed amount from the production in the reactor and the sample is from 1980. This is almost two half-lives. There will be generally only traces left in there if we assume that no separation of curium and americium was done, which would be economically very unwise, as curium is really expensive. And after two half-lives, there's only really not that much left. If no separation was done, undetectable curium-244 could also be present and for the 245, the half-life would again be too high for significant activities to search for these lines. I've searched and the most common line is the 175 kilo electron volt line with 9.85%. We have a peak there, but unfortunately americium has also a peak there. So I don't count it as evidence for curium 245.
In summary, we have evidence for curium-243 in the americium-241 sample. These radionuclides could also be present, but they are not detectable. Curium-244 would be less likely, but I don't have evidence against its presence in this sample. Now onto the last peak, 312 kilo electron volt line. What is that? That is prolactinium-233. This line has an occurrence probability of 38.2%. Other lines overlap with americium-241 lines. But why productinium-233? That's the daughter nucleus of neptunium-233. With a half-life of a few million years, it will never be in radioactive equilibrium with americium-241. Well, it can't be because the parent has a shorter half-life. So radioactive equilibrium is impossible. This sample is from 1980, which means roughly estimated 1 gigabecquerel is 1 billion decays per second. So 1 billion neptunium-237 atoms per second. So after one year, we have already 3 times 10 to the power of 16 neptunium atoms. And after 40 years, accordingly, 1.2 times 10 to the power of 18 atoms. Avogadro's constant is 6.22 times 10 to the power of 23. So that's about 2 micromoles of neptunium, which are almost immediately in radioactive equilibrium with productinium-233. Yes, I didn't correct for the decay, but that wouldn't change much. Productinium-233 could therefore be present in quantities that can be measured. The peak is very large because it originates from americium-241. The peaks of the other exotic nuclides were so small because they were there as traces or impurities. A few closing words, as already mentioned, curium is quite difficult to separate from americium. Industrially, they are separated using cation exchangers. You can still separate the individual elements quite well from each other, but since curium is so much more expensive than americium, I can well imagine that only minimal traces of curium are left in americium and the focus lies on having highly pure curium rather than the other way around. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.